Hello everyone and welcome back to the Great Book of Grudges. My name is Nathan and we're back with another Total War Warhammer video. Today we're going to do something a little bit more different. We're not going to look at new factions or massive reworks to already existing factions. Instead, we're going to look at each race that has been implemented into the game and we're going to see what legendary lords and legendary heroes are currently missing from those respective races. Just two notes before we begin. First off, this video will only feature races that have already been implemented to the game. So for example, Ogre Kingdoms, Demons of Chaos and so on will not be featured. And secondly, we're going to be looking specifically at each race's most recent army book. So we will not be looking at any supplements, expansions and former editions. However, if you guys want us to do any videos on those, let us know and we'll be more than happy to do so. But without further ado, let's begin. Total War Warhammer has a huge array of famous characters in the Warhammer Fantasy universe. But to say that that list is complete is far from it. In truth, Creative Assembly have barely scratched the surface on possible legendary lords and heroes. So in this video, we're going to look at all the possible legendary characters from their most recent army book that could be implemented into the game, and also speculate what unique mechanics they could bring into the fold. First, we look towards the Beastmen, and the first named character is Gore for the Beast Lord. Known as the greatest beast lord who had ever lived, Gorfor had actually been dead for quite some time now, but still features in its most recent army book. Even many centuries after his death, it is said that those beastmen who come from his bloodline are the most savage of them all. Gorfor is a melee powerhouse who also has minor uses in magic. Two of his special rules that could be translated into Total War Warhammer are as follows. First is Scion of the Dark Gods, where the Beast Lord should have access to some spells from the Lore of Death as bound spells. And secondly should be the Cloak of the Beast Lord, an enchanted item which would increase his leadership aura dramatically. This cloak was made from the hides of the many Bray Shaman he killed on his rise to power, something which is very uncommonly heard of in Beastman society. I'd also imagine that this character would also provide buffs to leadership, speed and melee combat to any Gores and Bestigors in his army. Next we have Gorus Warhoof, a Centigore character who is known as the Sire of a Thousand Young. His sons are already represented into the game as a Regiment of Renown unit, but they need his father to actually lead them. Given the fact that this character is a Centigore character, it's more than likely that Gorus would have a much larger campaign movement distance than most others. Also, I suspect that Gorus would also provide massive buffs to any Centigore units in his army, allowing a full 20 stack of Centigores to be somewhat viable just for his forces. Maybe a special building just for Gorus could also be implemented into his horde to allow him to recruit the Centigore units straight from the beginning. Now we move towards a fan favourite, Taurox the Brass Bull. This terrifying monstrosity has one goal and one goal alone, to cause as much destruction wherever he roams. The Brass Bull should have an insanely large amount of armour capabilities considering the fact that he is made from pure brass. An interesting mechanic that could be implemented for the Brass Bull could be to force actual warfare between different factions. Whereas you can declare war on any faction you wish as normal, but every few turns the AI will randomly declare war on something else. That, or if you're in the territory belonging to a faction that you're not at war with, your own hordes will start taking massive attrition damage, representing the Brass Bull killing his own beastmen, as he always needs to be in constant combat. It can also be speculated that he'd have a decent upkeep and cost reduction towards Minotaurs. Now we look towards Moonclaw. Moonclaw isn't actually a beastman, but rather living chaotic essence. He should be a rather decent-ish spellcaster with the ability to cast spells from the Law of the Wild and the Law of the Shadow. However, it's not magic that actually makes him interesting. He has two special rules that could be represented in game quite nicely. First off is Wave of Insanity, which would most likely reduce the leadership of nearby enemy units. And the last one would be Unholy Zenith, which would allow him to cast a small number of bound Warpstone Meteors into the battlefield. Think of it as a Doom Rocket, but maybe not so powerful. Now we look towards Ongrol Fourhorn, a rather interesting gore. He is an outcast in the Beastman Society, and should be represented as much in Total War Warhammer should he ever get implemented. 
Ungrawl should have loads of buffs towards Ungor units and if we ever get something on the lines of mutants and so on, they should be able to be recruited by Ungrawl Forhorn as a unique unit. To represent that Ungrawl is an outcast, the other beastmen should actually hate him and have a very large negative relation with him. Other units that are also not Ungrawl should have higher recruitment cost and upkeep. Basically this should be the hardest campaign ever for the beastmen. And now we're at the last character for the Beastmen and its most recent army book. The Bray Shaman known as Slugtong is repulsive in nature. He is often referred to as Walking Plague himself. Slugtong is a spellcaster who would have access to the spells of the Law of the Wild and the Law of Death. He would also have poison attacks and regeneration, possibly giving poison attacks to his whole army. His only special rule is that of the Curse of the Famine Fiend, which is also one of his titles, which could be translated into Total War Warhammer in a certain way. Basically, how it would work on the tabletop is at the beginning of the battle, anything within 36 inches of Slug Tongue must take a Starvation roll if they roll a 4 upwards on a d6. So what could be done in Total War Warhammer maybe is when an army attacks Slug Tongue, they suffer one round of attrition damage as if they were walking through highly chaos corrupted territories. The next race would have been the Bretonians, but unfortunately we've already covered all the named characters that featured in their last army book, as Bretonia had one of the smallest amounts of legendary characters in their army books. So with that, now we move towards the Dark Elves. Shadowblade is known as the Death That Walks Unseen, a legendary hero character which should have been implemented when the Crone Queen herself was actually brought into the game. A powerhouse in melee combat and incredibly fast, unfortunately Shadowblade actually doesn't have that many special rules that make him too much different to a normal Dark Elf Assassin. However, one rule could shine through that would actually make him very unique, the Heart of Woe, an enchanted item that should Shadowblade ever be slain, he would explode and do decent damage to anything around him. It's more than likely that this character would also provide benefits towards shades in any army that he so takes part in. But moving on, we have Kuron Darkhand, the captain of the Black Guard and one of Malekith's most loyal protectors. A powerhouse in melee combat, which would also dramatically boost up the ability of the Black Guard, possibly even making one unit specifically unbreakable. This should be a legendary hero choice only available to the Witch King himself. And lastly, we have Tolaris Dreadbringer, the Hand of Cain. This character could buff up Harganeth Executioners quite heavily, and also provide buffs in terms of augments such as a map-wide frenzy spell. This Dark Elf is also the true warrior of Cain, so he would most likely start in Orf 1, giving the Dark Elf something new to actually start in, and also give the High Elves a run for their money, considering that he would start with access to the Shrine of Cain. But now we move on to the dwarfs, with the first one being Forek Ironbrow, the master rune lord of Karakazul. Forek would always be with his powerful Anvil of Doom, which would allow Forek to have access to many spells in the form of bound spells. He would be unbreakable, and given the fact that he's mounted upon an Anvil of Doom, he would have a very naturally high armor save. Forek himself is unbreakable, and it would be pretty fun if you could actually choose a separate unit in that force to also be unbreakable too. Next up is Grim Burlockson, the Master Engineer, who I imagine would be a legendary hero, more than likely maybe unlocked by a technology tree? This character would provide various buffs to many dwarf units that have ranged weapons in the dwarf roster, say for example, increasing the range of dwarf crossbows and handgunners like he does in the tabletop, and possibly making the war machines do more damage. He would just be a support hero, but this would work quite well for any ranged armies that you're focusing on. And lastly, we have Joseph Bugman, the mysterious master brewer. I'll be honest, I actually thought about this character rather heavily because Joseph Bugman's actually one of my favorites. Joseph should not be recruited by conventional means, instead you actually have to go out and search for him in a very similar way as you would do for Gotrek and Felix. Getting access to this legendary character would provide your army with immunity to fear and terror, and also give them generic but decent army-wide buffs such as more armor, more melee attack, more range attack, and so on. However, he should only be available to you for around 20 to 30 turns, and then disappear again, to which then you'll have to go on another search for him. Every few turns you should get more or less a small hint as where he is, but nothing too concrete. And now we look towards the Empire. First up is Kurt Helborg, the Reichsmarshal of the Empire. He is a very big fan favorite, I've actually seen loads of forum posts about him. This character should give tremendous buffs to Reichsguard units and be very powerful in melee combat himself. My main issue with this character at the moment 
is the fact that the Solon Runefang, his special weapon, is actually now only available to those who capture the territory of Solond, which is currently held by Balthazar Gelt. Nonetheless, this character should be a legendary hero, he's quite iconic, and should be available to Karl Franz possibly as soon as he's able to start recruiting Reichsguard himself. The same could be said about Ludwig Schwarzhelm, which is the Emperor's champion and the Emperor's bodyguard. He should provide massive leadership bonuses to any units near him, considering that he is one of the most famous battle standard bearers in Warhammer Fantasy history. Next up is one of my most favourite characters in all of Warhammer Fantasy, Marius Lightdorf, the Elector Count of Averland, or the Mad Count as he's often known as. Technically this character has been dead in the lore for some time, but he's absolutely amazing and still had rules in the 8th edition army book, where he is absolutely insane and had very fun things to go about him. I imagine that this character would have very special events in terms of insanity in a very similar sense to Lufa Harkon, or maybe have some sort of sanity slash insanity meter which makes people hate you more if you're more insane but your troops do more damage and maybe higher relations with other factions if you were more sane but your troops would be more sluggish. Lastly we have Lufa Huss, the Prophet of Sigma. I actually don't think we're going to get this character for two reasons. First up, he's pretty much just a named warrior priest of Sigma, so he's not really that impressive. And second, it's very likely that we'll see the Nameless as a character, and Lufahas' body is actually used by the Nameless in the end times. This is pure speculation, obviously, but they've been hinting at many of the Motarchs in Warhammer 2 for quite some time. But now we move towards the High Elves, with the first character being Elfarian the Grim. Everyone pretty much speculates that this is going to be one of the legendary lords in the next DLC pack coming this May, and yeah, I kind of think so too. This is a beast of a close combat lord that also rides atop a griffin. I can imagine that this character would also cause fear against any goblins near him, and he would probably also have access to some basic spells, most likely in the lore of high magic, or maybe the lore of life. Honestly, I'm not too sure what special mechanics he would actually bring into the table. You always imagine this character having sky cutters around him and so on, and right now we don't have them in the game at the moment, Though it's more than likely that we'll actually see some sky cutters being created for this. Or at least that's my hope. Moving swiftly on, we have Core Hill, the captain of the White Lions. This should be a legendary hero character whose only job here is to boost up the melee capabilities of the White Lions of Sharace dramatically. He'd also be quite powerful in melee combat too, but I'm imagining him as a buff hero. Next up we have Karadrian, the captain of the Phoenix Guard. This is a really strange one, because in Warhammer Fantasy 8th edition, he was a legendary hero who was pretty much just a close combat fighter that could also ride atop a Phoenix, and maybe in Total War Warhammer he could also boost up the Phoenix Guards themselves, and probably boost up the Phoenixes too, specifically the Frostheart Phoenixes. But in Warhammer Fantasy The End Times, which is dubbed as 8.5 edition, he was the Incarnate of Fire, so if it's the case that he comes in much later into the game and they start implementing end time stuff, he could be a legendary lord that has access to the lore of fire. It's a strange thing, yeah, we don't know if they're going to do end times or not in the future DLC, but yeah, it's still very possible. But now we look towards the Lizardmen, with the first character being Chakax, the Eternity Warden. This would be a duelist hero which would buff up temple guards. The only thing I can see for them actually translating from his tabletop rules is the special rule of the Helm of the Prime Guardian, which is a special item he has that enemies within 20 inches would have to reveal themselves if they're hidden. This would be very useful versus stealth factions. I'd imagine they'd be much further away than 20 inches, because obviously the battlefield's much larger, but I'm not too sure. It could be interesting, a very weird mechanic, and you'd have no problems versus stealth armies like Clan Eshin, but that's pretty much it. Next up is Teto Echo, one of the very few skinks that are actually quite respected spellcasters. He rides atop his own palanquin and would have access to the Lore of Heaven spells. This character has a special rule where he's essentially dodging attacks from bolt throwers specifically, so I see this being more translated to buffing up the skink cohort units to be more missile resistant? Maybe just that? And the last character for the Lizardmen would be Oxyotl, which is a chameleon skink who seems to hate Demons of Chaos quite a bit, so I don't imagine him being introduced until Game 3, where he would probably buff up his units against Chaos Demons, and that's pretty much it. More than likely, he would also reduce the upkeep for chameleon skinks, and probably give them a little buff in terms of damage. Now let's look towards the Green Tide, which will hopefully be getting an update very, very soon. First up is Gorbad Ironclaw, the true ruler of Black Crag. 
Corbad was one of the most unique lords to ever be implemented into Warhammer Fantasy. Not only does he act as your general, but also as your battle standard bearer. So with that, in game, his leadership bubble must be incredibly high. Also, he has a special rule known as Orcs are the best, which would allow him to upgrade any number of Orcs into Orc Biggins in the tabletop. So I imagine in Total War Warhammer, this could be represented as giving massive buffs to Biggin units. Next up we have Grom the Paunch, which many believe will be the next legendary lord for the Greenskins. He's a massive fan favourite, because yes, he is a goblin, but he's not a weak goblin. He's a decent melee fighter who rides atop a chariot, he's a big chonky boy too, should gain the benefit of the regeneration special rule, and should pretty much buff up the goblin units to be a bit more terrifying in close combat than they already are, because right now they're just laughable. Next up is Snaggler Grobspit, who is essentially a Spider Rider, so more than likely he would provide loads of buffs towards the Spider Riders, making them maybe a bit better in close combat and a bit more durable. He also has the Hatred Empire special rule, so it could be that any army that he joins up, he could make them be a bit stronger, maybe give them a bit of extra damage against Empire armies. And lastly we have Gitilla the Hunter. Yeah, the name is silly, but then again, Greenskins. So this is another legendary hero type character that rides upon a mount. But instead of riding upon a spider, this one rides upon a wolf, so he would buff up any wolf riders around him and any armies that he joins. Something great too would be giving more ammunition to wolf riders in the same army too, to make them a bit more useful as just screen units, essentially. Generally, these legendary hero types weren't that impressive to be honest, but I know a lot of tabletop players who swear by them. But now let's talk about my favourite faction, the Skaven. Do we really need to talk about Fanquil and Bone Ripper though? I mean, we know they're coming, right? Like, it's almost definite at this point. Like, I'd be really, really, really surprised if we didn't get Fanquil in the game. Like, maybe in the third game, but if he doesn't show up at all, wow, I'll be shocked. Which leaves us only with two characters. First up is Frot the Unclean, a melee based Master Molder character who would be powerful against large targets, most likely have fear, definitely have regeneration, and would definitely boost up any monsters in regards to Clan Molder units such as Rat Ogres, Hell Pit Abominations, and any more that might be added in. And lastly would be a not so impressive pack master known as Squeal Nortooth. He's not very impressive in melee combat, and to be honest, he's just there to buff up either Giant Rats or Rat Ogres. And I don't think that we're going to be getting giant rats. I I'm not too sure just yet, to be honest. It could be part of a Clan Molder DLC, but we've still yet to see it. That being said, it would be an interesting addition. I used to use him every now and then when I used to feel loads of giant rats, and it kind of would be nice to see him in the game. The thing with the Skaven on the tabletop is things would either be amazingly awesome or just amazingly bad. But that's what made the Skaven fun, at least. Moving on to the Tomb Kings, first up we have the Herald and the Calf, the Emissary of Cetra. A close combat legendary hero type lord, which is also, well, decent. Not great, but decent. He used to be used mainly to force fear tests, and that's pretty much it, so I imagine him having terror in Total War Warhammer to translate. But now we have a fan favourite, Prince Apophis, the cursed Scarab Lord. So yeah, this is an assassin type character, so we'd probably see him as a legendary hero type, who would have close to 99% in terms of assassinating and causing wounds. Inside armies, he would also have terror and regeneration, and to be honest, I see him as one of these characters that would be quite good in close combat. A duelist sniper lord. You could use him to swarm around, take out any types of war machines, and then just try and snipe out a hero. And lastly, we have Ramotep the Visionary, which essentially would act like another Necrotect, maybe just being higher in the terms of buffs for any Construct units. The Vampire Counts actually had almost all of their named characters from the 8th edition army book, with the only one that's missing being Conrad von Karstein. This is the Mad Dog of Sylvania, an absolute psychopath who is well known for his close combat abilities. I'd like to see this character being implemented as a legendary lord type, being unbreakable, possibly immune to crumbling, and also with a special banner that he can give to one unit of Blood Knights that also makes them completely unbreakable and immune to crumbling. This is another character that's actually long dead in the lore, but hey, he was in the 8th edition army book and the model looks super cool. We're almost at the end now with the first of two factions being the Warriors of Chaos. So given the fact that the Warriors of Chaos legendary lords have also been split into Norska, we're not sure if some of them are also going to be moved to Norska or not. But that being said, the first character is Valkyr the Bloody, the wife of Khorne essentially. 
Heavily armoured, great at close combat and extremely fast moving, Valkyr is one of those flying type legendary lords which many want to see. Straight off the bat she would have access to her wings and be able to fly across the battlefield, targeting any stray lords and heroes that may be unfortunate enough to cross her path. Next we have Village the Cursling, a rather unique character since it's essentially two characters in one. These are conjoined twins that are in servitude of the Chaos God Zinch, one is a master spellcaster in the Law of Zinch, and the other is a powerhouse in melee combat. This would be one of those very few characters in Zinch's service that would actually be taken into the battlefield, whereas most of them actually stay very far back casting their spells. Next up we have Festus the Leech Lord, who is a generic low levelish spellcaster in the Law of Nurgle. He has regeneration and poisoned attacks, is decently tough in terms of taking damage, but is not very good at close combat. Instead, he would most likely boost up his units by giving them all regeneration. But that might just be a bit overpowered, so maybe just giving one unit of his choosing regeneration, so for example as a form of a banner. Now we look towards Scylla and Fingrim, which is a monstrous type legendary character. It's the Warriors of Chaos equivalent to a Doom Bull, essentially. Nothing too special there. It takes damage quite well, it's unbreakable, and it's just there to move quickly around and do its damage to whatever moves into its path. But lastly we have Gullroach the Great Drake, first of the Chaos Dragons. So the dragon itself is a level 4 spellcaster in the Law of Zinch, so he's quite proficient and very powerful. He's also a dragon, which means he has his breath attacks and so on. I see this being implemented in a weirder way, to be honest. If this character gets implemented as a legendary hero, because more than likely this wouldn't be a lord, I'd see this grand quest type of thing to try and actually tame the dragon. So in a very similar sense to how I suggested with Joseph Bugman, where you'd actually have to go on a quest to find the dragon, battle against it, tame it, and then be able to recruit it. I mean, the dragon units are already powerful as it is, so making one a legendary hero and giving it all the spells of the lore of Zinj, there'd have to be something put into place where you would recruit him later in game by going over a big quest. But now we're on the last race, the Wood Elves, with the first character being Aralof. This is a very competent hybrid in melee and ranged combat. I'd imagine he'd boost up the low level elves quite a bit, but that's pretty much it. The Wood Elf equivalent would be Draika, the insane Briar Maven of Woe. She's quite a good melee combat hero, and she's also got access to the spells of the Law of Shadow. The way I'd see her being implemented is some sort of insanity trait too, and more than likely having very high upkeep for elves and a high recruitment cost too. And given the fact that she is also, well, insane, I would probably make her have low relations with the other Wood Elf factions. But now moving on to the last yet to be implemented characters from the 8th edition army books. These are the Sisters of Twilight and I'm not too sure but I think that Creative Assembly shot these down, didn't they? I'm not 100% sure. But both of these characters come as one singular unit that can ride upon either a forest dragon or a giant eagle. They're both very good at ranged combat and also very good at melee combat. The thing is this character is very odd because their special rule is conjoined destiny, where if one of the sisters dies, she would come back if the other one hasn't been killed. And if they're the same unit, that would make that rule kind of impossible unless they're implemented as two separate lords, but then again, fluff-wise, they're always together. It's a bit of a weird thing. I'd see them being implemented together with a very, very abnormally large health pool and see them being used and how Scar, Snick and Glob are being used at the moment. So they'd both be able to fire, they'd all have their multiple shots, do a lot of damage and so on, get into close combat. It might be a bit difficult to do animation wise, so I'm not too sure if we'll actually ever see these characters or not, but to be honest, they're pretty cool. But with that, that is all the named legendary characters for the races that have been implemented into Total War Warhammer but are still not being represented in game. Like I said earlier in the video, this is barely scratching the surface of already established characters in the lore and so on, so it's more than likely that we'll see some of these characters but not all of them because they'll probably go to some later editions to pick up some others like they did with Rapunzel and a few other characters. That being said, are there any fan favourites for you in this list? Do you think that any of them would have any special mechanics, any special traits and so on? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below and let's start a bit of a discussion, shall we? But with that, my friends, we come to the end of our video. Thank you so much for watching. If you did enjoy the video, might I suggest giving the video a like or even subscribing to the channel as it really does help us out. In the description section below, we have various social media links such as Facebook, Instagram and Discord where you can get in contact with the Great Book team. 
Also in the description section is an affiliate link with Element Games where you could buy loads of hobby based products, not just Warhammer, for 10 to 25% off. Making a purchase with this special link also supports the channel at no extra cost to you, which we think is rather cool. A big thank you to our patrons, your support means the world to us. Honestly, it's amazing that people want to help a small channel like us grow and get to our higher level of content. A big thank you to our patron Gibraltar LUSC for subscribing to us at our fame level. Honestly, mate, you're super cool. And a big thank you to all of you for liking, sharing, commenting on these videos. Honestly, the channel's growing a lot lately and we're just so excited to see it grow and be able to speak to so many Warhammer fans across the world. But with that, my friends, thank you for watching once again, and we shall see you all again very, very soon. Have a good day.